Dr. Rajan, uh, the NPA crisis, and uh, you really attacked it as RBI governor. You brought it out in the open. We know the numbers now. We do you think we are over the hump, or do you think there's still skeletons in the cupboard? See, I I don't know enough to be able to give you a good answer to that, and I don't want to opine on it without knowing because people you will know think all that of know. the past. You know, well, all of the people will think as as governor, I know what the uh, I know what the current numbers are. So I I think it's inappropriate for me to comment on the specific numbers. I think we have come a long way from where we were in terms of redressing the balance between the creditor and the debtor. The uh, it used to be that the debtor, especially once they reach a certain size, had inordinate power. Uh, I'm doing badly, so call up your banker and say, "What hit are you going to take? Not what hit am I going to take?" That conversation has changed, and I think that's a change for the good because now. the promoter actually has to take risk uh, and his money is at stake now i am not saying that promoters didn't that all promoters didn't take risk but some are playing the system and and uh, to my mind the balance is much better today uh, we have to look constantly at the process of uh, raising money and paying it back to see how we can make development sometimes we get too harsh we have to back off from that sometimes we get too lenient i think we were too lenient before now you know after some experience with the system we have to ask whether we we're at the right point but are you happy with the way iibc has played out so far i i it has I, resolved I a lot of cases i think it's it's still in early days uh it has resolved a number of cases that is to the good of course there have been some pretty long delays also yes. and uh, the question is do, have we learned enough in that process and built enough institutional structure that those delays can be uh, shortened to what the original intent of the ibc was the experience with the debt tribunals and the um, surface was that eventually our uh, you know our traditional defaulters learned how to game the system and learn how to deal with the new set of laws mm. it is important that we prevent that gaming you know that brings me to the question of cronyism which seems built into our system you spoke of land acquisition for example being critical in a way to drive the engine of growth but the fact is the manner in which land acquisition is done we just have instances where uh, tribal land is being taken by companies using their clout with government often breaking environment laws and rules the community has no voice the adivasi communities of uh, of chatisgarh for example have no voice when a big uh, corporate comes in and takes over the land now do you believe that cronyism is almost inbuilt into the system do you see that breaking at all no but this, this is in part what i wanted to establish with the book that these same problems were faced by the western countries also and still continue to be faced that cronyism is endemic mm -hmm. and to some extent the one thing that prevents cronyism from becoming entrenched and this is ultimately the problem the fundamental problem of capitalism government and the private sector getting into bed together and staying in bed permanently the one thing that prevents that is repeatedly democracy uh pointing the finger at cronyism and saying you guys aren't working for the broader masses that's what keeps capitalism honest and to my mind that is what is going to be our savior also in this country a strong democracy rising up and saying there's too much cronyism we need a clean up we saw that in 2014 with the whole uh, rise of uh, the anti corruption movement and uh, you know aam aadmi party and so mm -hmm. on my sense is uh, you will see this again and again that uh, when uh, so long as democracy can stay strong now of course democracy itself can get perverted so when you talk about these adivasis being deprived these uh, forest dwellers and all that we know that you know there are champions of those uh, of of those uh, tribes and they themselves can get together uh, you know uh, to push their case and so to that extent you would expect a reaction at some point to strengthen their rights no but you're saying democracy will be the savior interestingly i saw a recent interview of yours where you suggested that the 2019 elections in this country is a choice between india being a flourishing democracy or a more authoritarian structure i want you today to be more specific <laughs> that was to a foreign <laughs> news channel so you could get away without being more specific what were you saying when you were saying that 2019 is a choice between india being a flourishing democracy or a more authoritarian structure well i i i think 
precisely the point that you raised uh, just now, that is that all these tendencies to go off track are essentially corrected by democracy. That democracy essentially says, you know, I, I don't like this. Don't go further in this direction. And so my sense is our electorate is pretty wise. Uh, every five years it opines. But uh, it opines in a pretty, uh, you know, uh, clear and significant way. And often not in the way that pundits sort of expected to opine before the election. Uh, I mean, I've just read Ruchir Sharma's uh, very nice uh, mm -hmm. description of the various uh, elections that he's been following. And it suggests that, uh, you know, we are perpetually surprised. My, I, I think democracy has to some extent to some extent a self-regenerating capacity. So when it sees forces that are pushing away from where it, it wants to be, it, it sends them a message. That's the closest you're coming to revealing your <laughs> mind in a way. You know, you're, you're suggesting somewhere in what you're saying that whoever is in power should be worried about people power. That, that the should government be. should not take the people of a democracy for granted, communities for, for granted. Uh, I think that is the lesson that our success with democracy suggests, right? Every, I mean, we've had, whenever the people have been asked, it's hard for me to look back on the history of our elections and find sort of any single election where you didn't think that this was a corrective, a corrective to the tendencies. Now, correctives go in, or often may go off into their own tangent, then you get a corrective to the corrective and so on. But that's the way democracy Because works. in your book, you do talk about populist nationalism. Yes. As, as you know, this sort of new driving force across yeah. the world, the rise of the strongman, you've spoken right. about that in some of your speeches. Do you believe that that is something that perhaps is here to stay? Or do you believe people at some stage will raise questions to the populist nationalist demagogues who now dominate the world no, the, I think or the, indeed this I country. I think the corrective to the populist nationalist uh, demagogue is precisely that they don't have all the answers. And the problem is that when you have this authoritarian person there in charge, nobody wants to speak up to them. And eventually that becomes the source of their downfall because nobody is willing to stand up and tell them, a spade is a spade or this is where you're going wrong, they don't really hear because they're never told. And so you get convinced by your own rhetoric, your own logic. As and happened with Mr. Modi and demonetization. <laughs> I think I've said enough about demonetization. No, but, but let, I, let me as in a ahead. sense, do you believe that the present government in India, that's the problem, that's the wake up call? Look, I, I don't want to talk about specific personalities. I, let me talk more generally that you asked a question about populist nationalists and mm. my uh, view is the populist has a role to play in saying that the elite are corrupt and we need the elite to change their ways. It's a corrective to the elite. But the flip side of saying the elite are corrupt, the technocrats are, uh, are, are too narrow-minded, etc., is not to say let's dispense with this completely, we will we will replace everybody with representatives of the people because the representatives of the people may not have the domain knowledge to actually perform what they are. Mm -hmm. So you need a balance between the two. You need some technocratic uh, this thing, plus you need some, uh, uh, you know, uh, some voice of the people. Populism has the right questions. Why am I not getting opportunity? Why am I getting uh, sort of crowded out? Why am I not getting a job? But often has the wrong answers. The you know populist on the left says tax the rich and we will make sure you're happy. And the populist on the right says it's those minorities or it's those foreigners, those immigrants who are responsible for your plight. I think this is a time when you know having heard the questions, the technocracy, the the quote unquote elite has to say okay this is where we've gone wrong. This is how we have to course correct so as to make the system work more broadly for everyone. Dr. Rajan, you said that manufacturing is the way to expansion of the economy. Now, manufacturing is precisely requires uh, tapping the international markets. One area where India has failed in the past five years. Our current goods exports are lower than what they were in 13. What's the solution? Now, uh, let me, uh, I, I don't know, you probably have my quotes better, but I, I have, if I said manufacturing was the way, that's not what I've been saying. It's, it's part of, yes. it's one of the, economic expansion. Uh, what we really need 
is to create the possibility for all manner of business. I mean, today, uh, you may not want to set up a textile mill, but you may want to set up a center which provides medical advice from here to uh, the United States. You tap in your medical symptoms and we'll give you the advice from that services qualified... Again. That services again. What's that? Services exactly. again. Exactly. So I'm saying goods exports, we've failed to tap the international so, market, all the growth of the five years... So uh, uh, what, what I'm saying is that we may have capabilities in areas other than manufacturing. I would be much more in favor of let's just build out what Whatever we need we to good build. At. Okay. No, no. Let's let's create the the framework. Okay. Uh, we need the infrastructure for whether it's for manufacturing or, or for services. Infrastructure creation itself will create so many jobs: affordable housing, uh, you know, highways, uh, ports, so many construction jobs. But on top of that, you make it possible once you have the uh, high speed uh, uh, sort of fiber network, Light. for example, for a service job to be put there or a manufacturing job. Let our industries, of which we have plenty and very capable ones, let them figure out what they want to do. They may figure out manufacturing, they may figure out services. Don't predetermine it. My question was also, just one moment, but my question was also how much, uh, how is it that we fail to tap the global market? Sorry. No, that is a worry and that goes back to my point about growth potential. That we seem to have somehow reached the limits of our growth. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, if we grow beyond a certain r rate, we find inflation starting to pick up. And that is suggestive that we have limitations. What we have to do is expand uh, the, our capacity to grow. And that's why I keep saying we need a second generation of reforms. On all the stuff we just talked about, but also on things like education. How can we improve the quality of our primary education, our secondary education, our tertiary education? Uh, these are things we need to think about. If we want to grow at 9% or 10%, then we need to absorb our labor force. So you're saying much more investment, therefore, in education and health than we've, than we've had so far. Certainly because we want to improve our human capital, but we also uh, need to create the growth to provide the revenues to finance the, the uh, a, a investment in education and health. Some of which will come from people's uh, earnings. But and and I thought one of the interesting examples you give in your book of inclusive governance is in Indore. Yes. Of how uh, you know, local bodies worked with the municipality, worked with uh, civil society groups to make Indore a clean city. Yeah. Do you therefore hold out Indore as a hope you know, in this age of Swachh Bharat? Can Swachh Bharat be done sitting in Delhi? through government uh, uh, diktat or does it have to be bottom up? Do we need a bottom up decentralized form of governance? No, I, you know, I love those advertisements uh, when we were trying to push Swachh Bharat uh, of, you know, people joining in yes. and pointing to that person who was littering and saying, okay, they are now contravening the social convention. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, obviously we need Swachh Bharat, we need a much cleanup, just if nothing else for the health of our children. But more than that, it seems to me engagement, community engagement is so important. I think that, you know, right from British times, we've gotten used to uh, my buff government will come sometime and do it. And waiting for the government, we ignore the fact that the community itself can engage and do many of the things we're waiting for the government to do. If we only got together, the spirit of the uh, frontier U.S. community, which much, a lot of U.S. has lost, but that spirit of raising the barn yourself, building the community uh, sort of structures that are necessary, the post office, so that is something that uh, we need to rediscover because there's so much that can be done, you know, irrigation, mm -hmm. uh, local irrigation tanks uh, by the community itself. Because you use the word civic nationalism yeah. in the book, almost to say citizenship and citizens' rights and duties matter above all else. Right. And I just sometimes wonder, you know, Citizens turn to me when I travel across and say, but you know, the, the VVIPs get away. Mm. You know, they, they can get away with their corruption still. Not enough of them are put behind bars. We still, I mean, that's the big difference between Western democracies at the end of the day. The US ensures if you violate the laws of the land, you will go to jail. In India, you may still get away. Mm. So, I mean, how do you generate that notion of civic nationalism, my sense of citizenship, when I feel that, you know, people still get away no, it's, with violating it's, it's, it's uh, working. the rules of the game? Uh, it's it's work in progress. Uh, I think we are getting better. Uh, we just talked about uh, debt. Uh, is debt an obligation to repay? It seemed like an obligation only for the small guy. Mm. Now increasingly it's getting to be an obligation for the big guy. We have some pretty good examples in the recent past. 
Uh, this is, uh, I think, a process by which the nation grows and brings more and more people under the ambit of the rule of law. And I think that is where we, that is where we bring all these balances together, a constitutionally limited government which has the capacity to do what governments need to do, a strong private sector but also a strong community which uh, essentially pushes for, for local activity. Is is the world staring at a recession? Let me just take it to the global economics. And do you think the world is staring at a recession and a lot of economists are beginning to apprehend? And if at all, how should India deal with it? I, I think it's premature to, I mean, I, I know that everybody is looking at the inverted yield curve and saying we're going to have a recession soon. Yes. Uh, I think at this point, all the central banks are getting uh, loser once again, uh, more accommodative on monetary policy. I think we have some potential for uh, still sustained uh, you know, moderate growth. Uh, so I, I would say it's premature to worry about it uh, in the sense of uh, you know, doing some, something dramatic, you know, flooding the market with liquidity or whatever. Mm. It's not too early to worry about our macro stability. So we have an election coming up, but I would think that uh, any government that comes into power post-election We'll have to think very quickly on how we restore uh, sort of a good sense, both about our numbers but also about our macro stability. Let me ask you the final question then, which I asked you at the start. Who would you vote for if you were in <laughs> India? You know, because we, we, are, we are told that a coalition, the, the ruling party says, look, we will provide a mazboot sarkar, a strong government, strong leadership. The opposition is described as a maha milavat, a coalition government which will not provide good governance. They in turn say that the Modi regime will lead to autocratic leadership, is destroying institutions. Where do you stand? <laughs> no, I, my voting behavior will be my own private. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you worry about institutions though? Under, uh, no, under strain, no, I mean, the, including as, the Reserve Bank of India? As we grow. Your successor also had to leave? Yeah. As we grow, I think we will have to keep strengthening our institutions. And that means making them capable of playing an independent role in the growth of the country. I think uh, that's why I've said in, in other sort of in other fora that we really, as far as the RBI goes, need to look at the statutory independence of the RBI. Does it trouble you? No, no. We we will have to think about it. It, it is not statutorily independent. Independent in the sense of you give it its objectives, and then you know monitor whether those objectives are served but let it have operational independence on how it serves those objectives. So if you say you've got to control inflation, you've got to control uh, sort of financial stability, have a process by which you see whether in fact it's doing those things appropriately, but let it run uh, doing what it must. Similarly, you know, for example, on the fiscal, we need a, some uh, independent body to opine on the projections in the fiscal whether in fact they're reasonable, and especially as we're taking on many of these long-dated entitlement schemes, uh, are they structured in such a way that they are affordable over the long term? That is something, all those things we need to bring about, those are institutions we need to create. And the question that I asked you even in an earlier interview is, is Dr. Rajan still keen to come back? There's this constant buzz <laughs> and you can, you can clarify yeah. today yeah. that A, you're advising yeah. the Congress party yeah, yeah, yeah. in some way, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. that you could be a potential finance minister yeah. if the Congress comes yeah, to You know, I, there are lots of speculations about... So you can clarify. Were, were, you, were you consulted on the were economic agenda? Were you consulted, for example, on the economic agenda, agenda by I, the Congress? I talk to anybody who talks to me. So, I'm so, so if the Congress talks so to you, they I, consult I'm happy to talk to anybody who talks to me. Did you advise on MIT? MIT? Min minimum income guarantee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> MIT. No, no, look, I, I, let, let me leave it. I, I'm happy to chat. And in fact, we put out a, a agenda for India, which you yes. referred to, uh, on you know some of the reforms that we think are reasonable. So you want to be bipartisan when it comes to your... Look, I, you're, you're ready to advise anyone who seeks your...